Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, BBRF's President and CEO. Today, Dr. Sakina Rizvi will present the Neurobiology of Pain Processing and Suicide, a Potential Marker for Suicide Risk. BBRF is the world's largest private funder of mental health research grants, supporting transformative discoveries in order to develop improved treatments, cures, and methods of prevention. The high quality of the research we fund is made possible by the BBRF Scientific Council. This group of 187 prominent mental health researchers reviews each grant application and selects the most promising ideas with the greatest potential to lead to breakthroughs. The Scientific Council guides the foundation to fund creative and impactful basic translational and clinical research relevant to the whole spectrum of mental health. One reason that research funded by BBRF has such great impact is because we do not limit our focus to one illness or condition. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $440 million to fund more than 6,400 research grants around the world and across a broad spectrum of brain illnesses, including addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, schizophrenia, as well as suicide prevention. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sakina Rizvi. Dr. Rizvi is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. She was a 2017 Young Investigator. <coughs> Our webinar will begin with Dr. Rizvi's presentation, which will then be followed by Q&A. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel of your screen. Feel free to submit your questions at any time following the presentation I'll ask as many as is possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rizvi. Sakina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Borenstein. I'm really excited to be here and thank you for the Brain and Behavior Foundation for inviting me to connect with all of you on this really, really, really important topic. Um, so today um, I'm going to, of course, talk about neurobiology, but I'm also gonna take a chance to talk a little bit more about suicide, um, get into the neurobiology, and don't worry if you don't have any brain biology background, you don't need one for this talk, uh, and um, also get into a little bit around, briefly around some treatments that are available, and also what we can do um, as a community to help ourselves, but also help others who are struggling with suicidality. I'm gonna talk for you around 45-ish minutes, so I can leave a good chunk of time for questions. I often find, um, doing these talks that there's a lot, and um, I really want to encourage a lot of questions, whether it's related directly to this research or not, so, so feel free. Uh, and also before we start, I really want to make sure that we are having these conversations around suicide with emotional safety. Um, if you're someone who is currently struggling or you're, you are supporting somebody who is, um, you never know what things might trigger certain emotions, and so if there's any point in, during this talk where you feel you're getting a little bit distressed, I really encourage you just to take a few moments to yourself. This session will be recorded, so you always have access to it. Um, and you know, taking those few moments, you can do different things to soothe yourself. Um, and for me, I'm a visual person, so you know, memories or things like that can be really grounding. Uh, this is an example of like two images from beautiful east coast of Canada on Prince Edward Island, which is one of my favorite places with the red sand. And you know, really indulging in the sensory aspects of those memories can really be um, helpful in terms of regulating emotions and calming down. So I also want to start off by mentioning languaging around suicide, and we're really trying to destigmatize how we talk about suicide as well. So you'll notice, you know, I don't we don't say committed suicide, but this comes from a time when, um, suicide was considered a crime or sinful, um, we say died by suicide. And you know, similarly, 
we don't say unsuccessful suicide. There's no such thing. Um, there's no success when it comes to suicide. We refer to it as an attempted suicide. So what is suicide? This, this might feel like an obvious question, but it's actually a lot more complex. Um, suicide is not a feeling. We don't feel suicidal. It's a behavior or we have uh, suicidal thoughts. And those thoughts and behavior are reactions to very deep emotional pain. And that pain might be different for different people. Um, I have clients, for example, who might talk about that their suicidal thoughts are really triggered when they feel lonely. Or uh, for others, it might be um, triggered when they're feeling um, feelings of shame or anger. So it's going to be different for different people, but it is at, at the core a reaction to very deep emotional pain that's very overwhelming. So it's really not about wanting to die. It's about not knowing how to live with the pain that, that the person is experiencing and not seeing any options out of that pain. And so it's, it, this is a, a global issue. We're all dealing with this. I, I understand that there's participants here from across the globe. Um, and this is something that affects all of us. There's um, almost a million deaths per year by suicide. And it's important to note that for every death, there's approximately 25 to 30 attempts, and that's likely an underestimate. Uh, and in some communities, this is a lot more prevalent in certain racialized communities, some indigenous communities, you see um, a much higher prevalence of, of suicide. I saw some recent uh, data coming out of the US showing increased suicide rates in uh, non-white individuals over the past few years. And um, alarmingly, it's also the second leading cause of death in youth. So this is something that's really important. Um, so I'm really glad that you're all here to talk about this and um, also talk about ways we can come together as a community to address these issues. So I mentioned that suicide risk is um, it's, it's complex and it has a lot of different risk factors that can be social, psychological, biological. So social things like um, uh, your income status, life stressors, social isolation, um, you know, female gender is tended to, tends to be associated with um, higher suicide attempt rates, but men are very highly disproportionately affected when it comes to, to, to suicide death. Um, psychological factors would include things like psychiatric history and history of trauma, um, things that might be impacting how you think, like memory, attention, problem solving. Uh, we also see changes in the brain, which is what we're here to talk about today, in terms of how the brain is structured and how it's functioning. So just as an example, these are some areas of the brain that are implicated um, in um, depression and suicide. And so really what uh, we see here is that, you know, kind of the center of the brain here um, are areas that are really important for kind of your emotional experience, um, whether it's, it's considered good, whether it's bad. Um, and then moving more to kind of the front of the brain is really important for understanding context, regulating emotions, um, decision making, problem solving, all the things like that are become really important. Um, you can kind of see this front of your brain as kind of like the manager, essentially. And um, so these areas of the brain are, are are, uh, have been found to be impaired in depression and some of these errors in suicide as well. Uh, and we also see that there are um, uh, challenges in terms of neurotransmitter function. And neurotransmitters are really basically the chemicals in your brain that help neurons talk to each other and they say different things. So this is kind of a very broad kind of uh, description of what some of these neurotransmitters do. Um, I'm not going to get into this in detail, but I just wanted to highlight more serotonin because this is what has been more um, addressed in the context of suicide. So, for example, having low serotonin has been linked to low mood and higher levels of aggression. So what this study was looking at was a brain imaging study looking at serotonin levels in the brain. And basically what they're showing is in this axis down here, this is your suicide ideation score. So a higher score means higher severity of suicidal ideation and thoughts that someone is having. And what they found was as this, uh, as suicidal ideation increased, serotonin binding increased. I'm going to ask you to take for granted right now, so we don't have to get into neuropharmacology, that this actually means that the higher binding means that you actually have less serotonin in your brain. 
So the kind of takeaway from this is less serotonin in the brain was related to higher levels of suicidal ideation and was also related to greater severity of um, more lethal suicide behavior over the course of two years. So there's all these different predictors that we found, and there's been a lot of great research that has been done um, across the globe in this area. So in terms of what leads to the transition, though, this is kind of where the challenge is, because in the context of depression, the majority of people have some level of suicidal ideation. And this can be anywhere from, you know, I, I don't feel like life is worth living to I have a plan to harm myself. Uh, and of those, you know, of those people, approximately 20 to 25 percent will go on to make a suicide attempt. And then from there, um, approximately three to four percent will die by suicide. So it's this 20 percent that I think is really um, still quite unclear. We don't have a really strong characterization of who this 20 percent is, which makes it very difficult clinically when we see someone uh, um, in practice to know if they're going to be the person who needs extra intervention to prevent a suicide. So how do we understand this? And I think a good place to start is from theory. So the interpersonal theory of suicide is one of the prominent theories that um, have been um, posited in the field and has um, there's been a, a good chunk of research done on it as well. And basically what this shows or what it suggests is that individuals when they experience uh, loss of belonging or social isolation, loneliness, or they feel like they're a burden on others, that these two things can generate a desire to die, but that this in and of itself won't lead to suicide attempt. So what leads to this transition? So what's theorized is capability for suicide is what is responsible for that, or what increases the likelihood of that rather. And capability for suicide is defined by um, fearlessness about death, as well as increased pain tolerance. So this makes sense, uh, you know, in order to override your instinct for self-preservation, uh, you know, fearlessness about death and also increased pain tolerance would be um, something that would allow you to do that. So Looking at increased pain tolerance, then I was really curious about this and flushing this out. And, and sure enough, when you look at the, the literature, we do see that individuals who have had a history of suicide attempt tend to have higher physical pain tolerance. And this would be like the maximum level of pain that you can tolerate. Interestingly, we also see more of a decreased ability to endure psychological pain. So you have this kind of dichotomy where people are feeling very high levels of psychological pain, but not feeling the physical pain as much. And I have some ideas around that, but um, we can maybe discuss that in the question period. We also see that there is an increase in physical pain threshold. So this would be the moment, um, you say if someone like pricked your finger, the moment that you felt pain, that would be your pain threshold. So people have different thresholds for when they actually perceive pain. And then we also see decreased physical pain intensity among people who have a, a history of suicide attempt. So this would be just how, you know, how painful it actually is for you. That's just kind of a subjective rating. So how might a person increase their pain tolerance or capability for suicide? How does this come about? Well, this can actually be dispositional. There could be some genetic aspects to that, or it could be um, acquired that there's that could actually be acquired over time through repeated exposure to what they call painful and provocative events. So there's research that suggests that firefighters, for example, or military personnel who've had more exposure to combat may have heightened capability for suicide. Uh, and I thought this was an interesting study to kind of um, make the point that this is something that might fluctuate. Uh, this study was done in men 18 to 39, and what they did was look at pain tolerance to a cold stimulus after playing either a violent video game or a racing game. And what they found was pain tolerance was higher after a violent video game than the racing game. And um, it took that to kind of interpret that, you know, that certain events can actually uh, 
increase your pain tolerance if they're considered painful. So, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to say that you should go up and, you know, get rid of all of your, your kids' PlayStations or anything like that. This is a very small study that was done. I think it's just interesting to make the point of um, how things can fluctuate and we really do need to look into this further to see how that actually plays out clinically. So again, I mentioned that there's these areas that are impacted in suicide and depression, but what about pain networks in the brain? So we see actually quite a bit of overlap uh, in terms of uh, depression, suicide and pain brain networks. Uh, particularly also in areas that, you know, that are of interest to me that help us perceive pain and also regulate emotions as well. So this, all of this information really is what led uh, me to explore this further and more deeply in trying to understand how pain is actually associated with capability for suicide and also trying to get a sense of, well, what are the neural correlates of that, like of capability for suicide? We don't really have like a comprehensive biological model of suicide risk. So this is kind of a step towards trying to get a sense of what, um, what other information we can glean. So, and also kind of looking at how these brain correlates are related to pain as well. So how did we do that? So in our biomarker study, we were looking at individuals with major depressive disorder, uh, as well as controls. And the depression group had some history of um, suicide ideation or attempt. Uh, they were moderately to severely depressed. And then the non-psychiatric controls um, didn't have any history and, and had no medical conditions. So in terms of what we did, we're actually still currently um, doing the one-year follow-ups in this group. So I'm gonna actually just present the baseline um, data. And we were looking at suicide capability using the acquired capability for suicide scale. Uh, and this is a scale that measures fearlessness of death and perceived um, pain tolerance, subjective per um, perceived pain tolerance. Uh, and then we, we explored um, suicide ideation and attempt history using the Columbia suicide rating scale. So I mentioned uh, before a cold stimulus test. And I'm gonna, this is what we used as well. This is a very, very common test that's used to, to measure pain tolerance. And so basically what it involves is putting your hand in a vat of water that's around two degrees Celsius. Um, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit because I'm, uh, I'm Canadian, so we do Celsius here. Uh, so in two degrees Celsius water, uh, which is cold, so I've done it before myself, and, and we measure exactly the point uh, when a person, in seconds, when a person first feels pain, which is your pain threshold, and the point where you can no longer tolerate it, which is their pain tolerance, uh, and then looking at the in pain endurance, which would be the time the, the time that you can tolerate pain. And you're not in there for more than two minutes to avoid numbness or any tissue damage. So again, I'm going to remind you of these brain areas. Again, I'll kind of keep coming back to this to kind of help reiterate it. Uh, we were really interested, again, in two particular areas in this study, uh, an area called the insula. And this area of the brain is really important for how we perceive internally physical um, sensation. Uh, and we're also interested in this area called the cingulate, which is important for um, emotion regulation and pain regulation as well. So we were interested in looking at brain connectivity in these areas, in the two parts of these specific areas actually. And so what does that mean? Um, brain connectivity is basically looking at when one brain area is, is active, are there other areas that are also tend to activate or decrease in activity? So that helps us to identify networks in the brain because our brains are essentially a big interconnected electrical circuit uh, and brains do not act in isolation. So um, looking at patterns of brain connectivity gives us more information about how the brain is actually functioning. So that's why we took this approach. And then we were interested in how those connectivity patterns were associated with suicide capability scores. So there was nothing kind of of note in terms of the kind of key demographics between the depression group and the control group. Um, the, the depression group did have a 70% lifetime history of suicide attempt. 45% uh, had a lifetime history of non-suicidal self-injury. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what that is, that would be people who may be self-harming, but there's no suicidal intent. It's actually uh, an emotion regulation 
uh, strategy. So what did we find? So first off, we did note that there was a pretty you know, strong correlation between uh, suicide capability scores and pain tolerance, uh, as well as pain endurance and pain threshold. And we noted that when we control for suicidal ideation, these scores were fairly the same. And that is an important piece because we want to make sure that we are targeting our markers to suicide attempt risk or suicidal behaviors um, because having a, a marker of suicidal ideation isn't as helpful because I can also just ask someone what their thoughts are. Um, people aren't always aware of what their behaviors are going to be now or in the future, so that becomes a little bit more challenging. Of note, we didn't notice these patterns in the controls, so this was exclusive to the depression group, which was also quite interesting. So again, coming back to the brain imaging, so we were focused again on these areas within the insula as well as two areas in the cingulate and looking at brain connectivity patterns from these areas. So for those of you not familiar with brain biology, you can feel free to ignore all the technical terms and details here. I added them for those who may be curious um, or the researchers who may be present here. And so basically what this finding shows is that when the part of the brain that helps us perceive pain intensity, uh, when that part of the brain is active, another part of the brain important for how we cognitively and emotionally process pain is less active. And that pattern of brain connectivity is associated with capability for suicide. So our interpretation of that is essentially that higher suicide capability is associated with brain functioning in a network in a way that leads to reduced perception of pain. We also looked at another part of the insula that's important for perceiving when pain is present. Uh, we observed that when this brain area is active, another part of the brain that is important for how we regulate our pain response in terms of things like attention or memory uh, is also active. So we interpreted this to mean that a higher suicide capability may be associated with brain functioning in a network that exerts more control over when pain is perceived to be even present. Okay, so, so let's switch to two cingulate areas of the brain. I, I do wish I could see you so I could see whether your eyes are glazing over and I need to adjust how I'm explaining this, but uh, here we are. So um, the first area we were interested in is important for how we understand and feel about pain. Um, and it's also important for us to get information on what is reinforcing or not. So uh, what does that mean? If you eat a piece of cake and you think it's delicious, that's a positive reinforcer. So if you put your hand on a stove and scream with pain, that hot stove is a negative reinforcer. So these reinforcers help us to determine whether we should move toward or away from something in our environment. So, and when this area of the brain is active, so is the area of the brain that's important for our ability to reinterpret situations to have a different meaning and emotional impact. So if you are sick at home and have to miss a party, you can reappraise the disappointment you experience and think that now you get to stay home and watch all your favorite movies, which lessens the disappointment, for example. So you know, we were interpreting this to mean that higher suicide capability may be associated with brain functioning uh, in a network involved in the extent to which pain is perceived as negative. Okay, so this is kind of more of the last brain imaging side before we get into some of other concepts. Um, similarly to the last two brain patterns, uh, this one is also related to activation in one brain region associated with activity um, in another. So this area of the brain, which is called the subgenual anterior cingulate, is important for regulating emotion and inhibiting perception of pain. And this brain area was correlated with activity in another brain region that's also important for emotion and pain regulation. So we interpreted that to mean that higher suicide capability may be associated with brain functioning in a network related to increased inhibition of pain and effective reg regulation of, of pain perception. So it may be reducing pain perception more at a cognitive or um, affective um, level. 
So again, what was interesting was that we noted that these patterns were specific to the depression group and not in the control group. So what does this mean? So essentially the takeaways from this particular study are looking are saying that behavioral pain might be an objective marker capability for suicide. Um, currently we really just have um, questionnaires or questions that we ask people to measure these things. So having an objective marker to help stratify risk could be really useful. Um, it also shows that the correlates and the brain connectivity patterns that we found um, also overlap with pain networks that are really important for how we perceive pain and how we feel about pain and how we come to understand it. And then also, it's interesting that these markers were specific to depression. We didn't note them in the in the control group. So um, that is um, positive and promising in terms of being able to differentiate. So I guess the key thing is that we need to kind of see if this pans out and the same pattern of results might be observed across other disorders or other psychiatric conditions. So what are the next steps in this type of research? So we do need a better understanding of neurobiology of pain and suicide risk. So we're currently running studies right now to explore that, uh, where we're actually um, testing pain while the person is in the scanner. Um, so that was going to really help us kind of get more of a nuanced understanding of what's happening. And we also want to look at the stability of suicide pain markers. So are these markers modifiable? Are they only present when um, someone is in acute distress? Or are there markers that might um, be stable over time that we can actually use to measure kind of traits of, of a person that might help us to stratify suicide risk. I also mentioned this implication around objective tests because we currently only have, you know, we only measure these things clinically right now. Um, and if there's something that we can add to or a battery of tests to measure suicide risk assessment that can help us be more accurate, that would be really helpful. There's also an implication here for developing new therapeutics. So we're going to talk in a little bit about, um, <coughs> excuse me, about um, brain stimulation. But uh, so in order to do brain stimulation, you have to have certain brain targets. And so doing this brain imaging type of work could help to identify new targets. Uh, in terms of developing new psychotherapies, uh, it's also helpful because there's research that shows that um, higher pain tolerance is associated with less awareness of one's internal physical state or say like not being attuned to one's body. So um, theoretically we could explore adding more body or somatic therapies into suicide risk intervention that could help a person become more body attuned for example. Um, and I want to kind of also highlight that you know when we're looking at markers of suicide risk you know there's not going to be that one thing that uh, is able to you know, uh, explain all of the risk. We're really trying to piece together different pieces of information, develop a more comprehensive model of suicide risk that integrates different aspects from the social side, the psychological side, and the biological side that can help us to predict risk more effectively. So I think this is all well and good, but I think that there's also a lot we can do um, as a community to help each other out. Um, and I'm going to switch a little bit then to the interventions for suicide risk. So there's typically three main methods that people are using, medication, brain stimulation, or like psychosocial therapies. I'm just going to have some water. Uh, and so medication-wise, I wanted to highlight um, some some newer research uh, so there's of course people to take antidepressants but there's also ketamine brain stimulation in the form of electroconvulsive therapy or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or psychotherapies in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy dialectical behavior therapy are also used as interventions for suicide risk so this is a, a study using ketamine which is an anesthetic that has been used um, like in surgery for example 
Uh, but at lower doses, this, this has actually been found to have some pretty um, rapid uh, antidepressant as well as anti-suicidal effects. So in this study, you can see in the red line, these are individuals who received um, ketamine infusions and saw that within about four hours, there was a pretty significant drop in their suicidal ideation scores that maintained over the course of six weeks. So ketamine was compared to this drug called midazolam, which also has kind of sedative effects, but also anti-anxiety properties. And um, we did, they did note some improvement there, but most people didn't have a, a, an improvement with midazolam. So those people who didn't improve received ketamine and then noted that by day one, um, since uh, after receiving ketamine, there were significant drops in their suicide ideation score, uh, which maintained out over the course of six weeks. So I think this is really interesting research. And I think over the next, there's a lot of current research going on in this area. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of, um, of new data on this in the next uh, year or two. So I refer to brain stimulation. So for those of you who aren't aware, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation is uh, something where they use this magnet here and they put it over the, uh, the, the front, an area of the front of your brain and remotely stimulate it this way. And what they found that if you do this on both sides of the brain, that uh, suicide ideation scores decrease by about 40%. And when they only did one side, it decreased by around 27%. And then when they used a sham, like there wasn't actually, they weren't actually receiving any stimulation, it reduced by about 19%. So I mentioned that there's different psychotherapies uh, that people uh, use to address suicide risk. Um, and I wanted to highlight just a, a new uh, psychotherapy that I developed uh, with my team called the Brief Skills for Safer Living. This was done uh, and developed in response to um, the lack of access to mental health care that we saw during the pandemic, uh, which was pretty significant. So this intervention is actually 90 minutes. So my, my colleague actually developed a 20 week group therapy that's very intensive. And we're like, well, what if we try to do that in a single session? How can we make this happen? So it's a 90 minute session and we do a lot in that 90 minutes, uh, really around understanding an individual suicidal experience um, when did it start? What is it? What do you, how are, like what is it responding to? What will it end? What would suicide end for you? Um, and then looking at skills building um, to help keep oneself safer. Can you understand and identify your triggers so that you can intervene earlier before the suicide risk starts to escalate? Uh, and then developing a safety plan. And I think more important than actually developing a safety plan is identifying the obstacles to enacting the safety plan. So it, it's very easy to come up with plans to do things. And we see this all the time with our own self-care plans, but we really need to look at what the barriers are to making sure that, that we stay on track with it. So what we found, um, and the study is pretty much almost over in the next couple of months, is that from baseline to three months, we see a significant drop in suicidal ideation. So that's really promising to me, especially because it's this is an intervention that was designed to be implemented in the community settings into hospital settings because it uh, you know it doesn't require as much training it's only a night a single session so a lot of people are on wait lists and you know intake coordinators or things like that could potentially be doing an intervention like this to help people uh, basically give them a bit of a booster in, in a sense uh, before they actually receive longer term care so again, I mentioned that, and you're going to hear me say this several times, that uh, community is very, very, very important. Uh, you know, it, it research takes a long time, and community interventions, we can we can do that right now. So I, I, I'm really a huge advocate for that. So what can you do to help yourself and other people? So this might sound obvious to understand your biases and stigmas, but I don't I don't know that we're doing this enough. So even as a psychotherapist. You know, I ensure I have a self-reflective practice and understand what my biases might be to someone. And I think it's important that everybody does this so that you know what's happening that might prevent you from listening to somebody and supporting someone in a way that they need you to. So I think that that's a very important piece. So developing emotional literacy is really step one 
in learning how to cope with emotions. Uh, it's actually a coping strategy in and of itself, which is why my colleague calls it name it to tame it. Uh, and so really when you know the details of what you're feeling, uh, you have the opportunity to identify what it is that you need, and then you can choose how you want to handle that. And then it also provides you more, op more information in terms of um, what you need to problem solve. So rather than saying something like, I don't feel good or I feel sad, uh, and you, which are more vague, and when things are vague in and of itself, that can lead to confusion and feeling overwhelmed because you don't really know what's happening. And so one might drill down and say, you know what, I'm feeling lonely. And, and now you have a choice as to whether you want to reach out to others or, or for company or not. So that's just an example of how you can use um, emotions to help yourself and how your emotions are directly tied to the coping strategies that you need to use to support yourself and others as well. Um, education is so important um, and there are a wealth of resources that people can access. Um, I'm assuming that many of the people here are from the U.S., so um, that's why I, I added these. You do have a national crisis hotline as well as the youth line. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has a wealth of information on their website for people who want to learn more about suicide and its treatment. Uh, and I think that open and judgmental communication is easier said than done. Um, and I think especially because it can be very scary um, when you are supporting someone with suicide risk and because you really want to support them. And um, it's really understanding that either you or the person is in pain and they don't want this, they want to feel better and, and being empathizing and being curious. Curious is such an important word, being curious about what they're going through because sometimes things are hard to relate to, but just because you haven't been through a certain experience doesn't mean you can't be an incredible support for somebody, um, but it requires that curiosity. So you may notice that this isn't a skill set maybe uh, maybe you have, and I, I call it a skill set because it is something that can be developed and it's something that everyone can learn to be good at. So it's also important to get support from a professional. So as much as our family and friends are amazing supports, uh, they can't replace that. So there are certain skill sets and things that a professional can bring to the table who's trained in suicide risk. Um, and also on the other side of that, for people who are in more of a caregiving role, it's also important for you to have a space to talk about your feelings and what you're going through, any anxieties or, or stress that you experience as well. So um, I, I think that that's not um, uh, encouraged enough. And I think that that's something that's really important. So these are just some basic uh, do's and don'ts um, around supporting someone with suicide risk. So things you want to do are you know, assess for warning signs. So do, are they feeling hopeless? Do they have access to suicide means? Do you find that they're withdrawing um, socially or withdrawing from, from, from life? And if you're noticing this, like speak up, and I really want to normalize this question as much as possible where you're asking someone, are you having thoughts of suicide? Do you feel like life is not worth living? And I, I really do appreciate that that could be a very scary question to ask. And you know, I was just talking to a client yesterday who said I was scared to ask because I don't want to put the idea into someone's head. I said, that's not going to happen. The risk is not talking about it. So I really, really want to normalize that um, as much as possible. And as I mentioned, active listening um, is a really important piece. This is making sure that you're staying with someone as they're talking. So you're not thinking about what you're going to say and what you're, how you're going to respond. You're just staying with them and being present with them as they're talking to you and, and, and taking in what they're saying. So some of the don'ts uh, would be arguing. So saying things like you have so much to live for, your suicide will hurt your family, are, are pretty invalidating, um, to be quite honest. Uh, this is someone who, if they're talking to you about it, are basically saying, I'm in a lot of pain. I don't know what to do. Can you please help? And I'm looking for some support. 
So um, I think it's important to recognize that, again, like they don't want to be going through this, but they're looking for some sort of validation that this is hard. What you're going through is must, that sounds really, really hard. And how can I, what do you need and how can I be there for you? So similarly, you know, lecturing on the value of life um, is also not really, uh, it's not helpful um, and can sometimes be very invalidating for someone going through it. Um, also promising confidentiality is something that you don't want to do uh, because if someone is imminently at risk or, you know, you're also young, uh, you know, teenagers and your friend is, is, is having this issue, this isn't something that you need to, that you can keep to yourself, right? If someone needs help, they need to get help. Um, so, you know, confidentiality in these situations isn't, you know, isn't, isn't helpful. So also problem fixing is kind of, you know, in the same way of like arguing or lecturing on the value of life, it's trying to fix the problem. Um, and sometimes people don't realize the power of just listening to someone and having them feel heard is an incredibly powerful experience. I experience it as a psychotherapist all the time. And even in those 90 minute sessions, it was incredible the shift that happened over the course of 90 minutes in how someone was feeling, where they were initially incredibly distressed. And by the end, they were feeling more empowered and they felt they had a better understanding of their experience. Um, so that I think these are things that we can learn how to do. I think it's also important not to blame yourself. Um, you know, people have different journeys in life. And, um, and like, like I mentioned before, there's so many different risk factors for suicide risk. And, you know, not all of these things are things that we can control either. So um, I really want to uh, thank all of my incredible colleagues who I work with. Um, I work with an amazing team globally on, on the work that I do. I also want to really thank the Brain and Behavior uh, Research Foundation for their support in this work. Um, suicide research is very underfunded, so it's amazing to have a resource like the Brain and Behavior Foundation to, to support work in this area. So some of the key takeaways and resources that I want to talk about is really just suicide is really not about wanting to die. Um, it, there's, it's, it's such a multifaceted, complex um, behavior that we're still trying to explore as researchers, and it's a, it, it is a challenge. Um, and so looking at pain processing, pain processing as I mentioned, is, is one aspect of this uh, as a marker of risk. It's not necessarily going to be the thing that is uh, going to explain everything because, again, there's, it's, it's a multi-layered um, thing. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, research takes time, but community support can happen right now. So it's so important that we build that community of support for each other. Um, so I've listed here, again, other resources for you, including the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention, uh, Beyond Blue, I think, which is based in Australia, also has a great wealth of information too. Uh, through our program, we actually published this book called What It Takes to Make It Through, Stories of Suicide Resilience and Loss which is a collection of um, lived experience stories of people who have been impacted by suicide or suicide loss um, and their path to healing. Uh, it's, it's, we, we really designed this book to be very raw um, and uncensored. So we did very, it was more just grammatical editing. So it was really just, this is their experience. And I think that it's, uh, it's, it's very powerful um, and can help people understand how how far someone can go in terms of like, you know, say they, they're, they're going over the edge, but they found their way back, even from that, like it's, it's, it's quite inspiring. Um, other information, um, I did a, a, a podcast earlier this year on the happy molecule. This isn't talking about brain imaging, it's just talking about suicide in general um, and things that we need to consider. Uh, and that is it for me, right at 45 minutes, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Um, I really wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, as I mentioned. So I, I look forward to, to speaking with everyone. Uh, Sakina, thank you so much uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, you covered a lot. And uh, thank you for the research that you, that you do and the clinical care. I want to delve into one of the, I think, key points that you made and just speak a little bit more about it, which is um, about 
uh, asking someone about suicide. Um, I, there's a misperception that asking could put that idea in somebody's mind, but actually asking could save a life. I'd like you to speak a little bit more about that. And also, what's the best way for somebody to ask? I, I think I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I think it, like, again, like I really wanted to normalize this. Um, in our research, we're talking about it all the time for, with people. And you know the research shows that there that that's not going to happen. It doesn't put the idea in someone's head. It was already there, um, and people are exposed to a lot of information. And just having the conversation isn't going to make someone think like, oh, that's that's an option for me. Um, so I don't think that people. I don't think you need to feel worried about that part. Um, if I did, as a suicide interventionist, I would never ask that question. But I ask it all the time. I ask it multiple times. Um, and I'm very directed by it. But again, I can also appreciate how that's scary. Even when I started, even when I started as a suicide interventionist, it was a bit daunting. You know, it was like, oh my gosh, this is very, it's very direct. And it's very, you know, so and I had to kind of work through that and be like, no, this is okay. Right? It's okay to ask this question. Um, and it's really important. And in terms of asking, it, it's quite simple. It's really like, you know, like, how have you been feeling? If someone's been feeling depressed, like, you know, or even if they're not depressed because suicidality doesn't occur just in the context of depression, um, have you been having thoughts that life's not worth living? You know, can we can we have that conversation? Can we open that up? Now, someone also needs to feel safe enough to talk to you about that. So it's also about beyond asking the question is creating an environment where someone can respond to you when you ask that question. So um, it might be, again, um, for clients that I work with, <clears throat> whether you're a parent or a partner, hearing that from somebody that they are scared, that, sorry, that they do feel like life's not worth living can be scary to hear. Um, and of course, you know, you want this person to be around, you love them. Um, but the best thing that you can do is try to manage that fear in the moment and just stay with them when they're talking about it. Because if they're talking about it, this is good. It's good that they're talking about it. Um, there's opportunity when people are talking about things. When people aren't talking about things, that's when there's no opportunity to intervene. Uh, very good guidance, very important. Um, I'm happy that you emphasized it in the talk. Probably one of the most important take home messages for people to have. Um, I'd like you to speak a little bit more about safety plans. What does that entail? How does that work? Give us a little bit more information so people could understand um, some of the nuts and bolts of that. Yeah, sure. So safety planning is typically something you will do with a mental health professional. Um, it is something you can do on your own as well. Uh, but you know, having that guided as a process can be helpful. So the way we do safety planning in our intervention is really identifying, okay, what are your like top three triggers for, for suicidal thoughts? and for you know going into a suicidal crisis um what are um the coping strategies that you found are maybe the most helpful for you um who are the people that you can connect with when you're like i need help right now and who are and, in, and also who are the um, community resources your doctor or other community resources that you can also connect with the suicide crisis lines um, that you can connect with when you need help um, also looking at how you can create a safer environment at home. So, you know, for example, people with different uh, suicide means, how can we make it so that's less accessible for you? So whether it's, you know, hiding something or making, putting it in a place where you cannot get to it unless it's very, very difficult. It's all about trying to buy time because, you know, a suicidal crisis you know, it's going to happen in a wave and it's not going to last forever. And eventually that front of your brain, which is kind of disconnected, this happens to all of us. When we're, when all of us, when we're out of distress and we're out of our window of tolerance, the front of our brain, that's, I said, is the manager kind of goes on leave and says, I'm going to wait for the rest of your brain to figure this out before I come back online. It's a lot more difficult to process information. It's a lot more difficult to problem solve and make decisions. So um, this is why when someone's in crisis, trying to explain things to them is not really a good strategy. It's really about de-escalating. So trying to buy yourself some time so that you can bring your cognitive resources back online in order to be able to make 
decisions that will be safer for yourself. And then we're looking at like, what are the different things um, that you can do? So sorry, I just want to add in terms of environment, um, creating a safer environment can also be things like creating an environment that's more soothing to you. So, um, you know, is there a place in your apartment or your house that is like your, your place where you go to, that's your, your little sanctuary, whether it's with your favorite blanket or certain candles or there's certain pictures around that you can kind of condition to be like your soothing spot. So things like that. So we also want to look at what are the obstacles? Like what are the reasons why you're not going to do this? And let's be very, very real about it. Um, and so different people have different um, uh, responses to that. Um, and so we're just trying to explore and do some problem solving together around how you might be able to get around those obstacles. Uh, excellent, excellent. I, I, I want to ask you about the issue of contagion, that if a famous person dies as a result of suicide or someone that, that people know sometimes in you know, the terrible situation in a school, um, other people um, being at higher risk of suicide. Could you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we definitely do see contagion effects um, when there are reported uh, deaths or um, people experience that, you know, say in schools or other things like that. Um, it does happen. Um, what I think is important though is um, in terms of say famous people who die, I think there's also a big responsibility uh, for the media and how suicide is reported. Um, and there are guidelines um, on that that are published in things like not mentioning suicide means. But I think also a big piece is leaving people with a sense of possibility. So you'll note that even in, in the book that we um, put together, what it takes to make it through one of the things that we went through is we took those guidelines, those media guidelines, and we went through the whole book and made sure that it was safe on that front. Um, but I think it's um, it's it's really important to um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so when it when it comes to contagion effects, I think that's really important to be leaving people with a sense of hope, and that's what we really do try to do in this book. That yes, it was this hard, but there's also this possibility. And my colleague. Um, Mark Senior at Sunnybrook um, does work in this area and um, uh, saw a talk that he did recently showing that when 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 an ad ended with a sense of hope, it had it didn't have the same that same effect that um, it would have if they didn't and you just someone died and um, that was it right and there was people or that leaves some people with a sense of hopelessness. So um, I think that there's a lot of responsibility in how we. Um, address these things. And I think that there are opportunities for us to intervene even on that front. Good, good, thank you. And we've seen um, reports on the increase in, in suicide occurring in, in the United States and other countries around the world. You described the international statistics. What, what do you see the, as the causes of the increased uh, risk uh, an increased rate of, of suicide? It's a very good question. Uh, it's very multifactorial and I think it's different in different countries. I mean, I think that during COVID and during the pandemic, across the board, it seemed like all the studies were showing that, um, and even the multiple ways of data they collected in Canada, that um, levels of ideation were increasing. The interesting thing was like, at least in the context of Canada, it has actually translated into a higher suicide rate. But this is definitely occurring in other areas. Um, I think that the pandemic um, didn't have the effect that necessarily we were thinking it would. And but I actually, on a, on a global level, but I definitely think that it has impacted people uh, disparately, and people who are in different uh, marginalized groups um, may have. I think we'll see once we get more nuanced data um, how this has impacted people differently on that front. Um, I think. Um, other risk factors, you know, things like um, whether it's financial instability that has, you know, been really problematic. Um, and I also think it's a huge, you know, not having access to care. Um, I also, you know, this is kind of my own personal thing that I talk about a lot is I feel like there's a big breakdown of community 
where people don't have the same social networks and support that I think that were there before. Um, and I think that that is really, I think that is life-saving. It is absolutely life-saving. And if you think about the fact that back from the, uh, the model that I showed showing that suicidal ideation can be triggered by feeling lonely, like, well, what if we took that out of the equation? There's something we can definitely do about that to make sure that people feel supported and don't feel um, alone in what they're going through. Um, all very important points. Um, let me ask you as, as a final question, where do you see us being in five years from now, 10 years from now, with regards to suicide prevention, both based on research and based on um, resources uh, and knowledge in society? I'm, I'm really hopeful, um, to be quite honest. Um, and I was just showing my master's student earlier today that, you know, um, in terms of neurobiology research in suicide, it was pretty slow. Like, there wasn't a lot of people doing this work, but just in the last two, three years, there's just been like a huge um, explosion of research on this front, which is really exciting. There's more people who are on this. There's more people who are developing new interventions. So I'm not the only one. There's other people who are developing different brief therapies to really help make sure that people have access. Uh, we have more information. Uh, we have like you know websites that you know that i've mentioned that have a lot of education and people are building more programs um, around this i think it's becoming more of something and more of a topic that people are willing to talk about and so that also in and of itself makes me hopeful that that is going to be something that's going to be helpful um, there's several you know, you know community-based suicide prevention is something that we're working on on our team as well in the next two years we're building we're trying to build a, a nation a nation a national program um, to a community-based prevention program, suicide prevention program. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really confident that things like that, that we can learn from each other on a global scale to see what other people are doing, to see how we can implement those things in our own communities, our own hospitals, um, so that we can make sure that people have access. And I think that that's a kind of a key thing, that there has to be uh, equitable access to care. Because right now, I think the people who really need it um, uh, who are disproportionately affected, and that's kind of what I mean by that, um, are not necessarily getting the kind of access to care that they need. Um, thank you. All very, very good points. want to emphasize, at least for the people in the United States, and hopefully there's equivalence in other countries, um, that uh, as of this past summer, there's a new hotline number, 988, so instead of dialing 911 for an emergency, for a psychiatric emergency, including a suicide risk, um, people could dial 988 um, and um, speak to someone who could then offer them help. And that's an important resource that hopefully will have an impact uh, in terms of safety. Um, I'd like again to thank you, um, Sakina, uh, for an extremely enlightening presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And I'd ask people to please consider making a donation to BBRF today. 100% of every dollar donated for research is invested in our research grants. We're able to do this because our operating expenses are covered by separate foundation grants. This means that when you donate a dollar for research, that dollar goes directly to the scientists. To make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with family or friends, um, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. And please join us again on December 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern time when Dr. Lois Chai Kine, director of the Gunderson Personality Disorders Institute at McLean Hospital and assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, will present, quote, online video education and assessment to empower individuals with borderline personality disorder. Thank you and remember, together, we can dramatically improve the lives of those living with mental illness and enable more people to live full, happy, and productive lives. Once again, 
Thank you. Take care.